SLC, do you have big feelings about the way the Utah legislature is ruling your life? Here's the deal. There are actually four election days in Utah, and caucus night on March 5th is arguably the most significant. It's when you choose your delegates, and those people ultimately pick the party's candidates. So Women's Work Utah wants you to pick a political party and show up on Neighborhood Caucus Night, Tuesday, March 5th. Get all the information you need to do this at womensworkutah.com. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. A record number of passengers traveled through the Salt Lake City Airport last year. But what does the future hold? Today felt like a good day to grill the airport's executive director on everything from his salary to the whole Delta thing and when we will get nonstop flights to Korea. Because why did I know so little about this city inside our city? It's Monday, February 12th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Bill Wyatt, executive director of Salt Lake City's Department of Airports, a.k.a. head of SLC International. You're here to answer our burning questions about the airport, and I want to start with money. The airport budget is bigger than the entirety of the city's general fund. Last year's airport budget was $520 million, a number I can't even fathom, compared to the $448 million for the general fund. How is the airport funded? Well, I think um, just to be uh, sort of big picture about it, user fees. There are no taxes involved. Uh, we huh. rent space to the airlines. We rent um, gates to the airlines. Uh, we rent space to the rental car companies. We charge for parking. We get rent from our concessionaires. Hmm. And the number that you just quoted actually includes the capital construction project, which is the new SLC as well. It's not part of the annual operating budget. And that comes from a combination of debt that will be repaid, municipal bonds that we sell. Uh, and that's largely repaid by uh, fees that we get from all of the above, the airlines, concessionaires, uh, rental car companies, and so forth. It's Way more complicated than that, but that's really what it is. <laughs> Airports are paid for by the people who use them. Wait, so then would it be fair to say that the cost of renovating the airport, like the new construction, the new airport, that there are some taxpayer dollars at work in that, but that the day-to-day -day operations of SLC International are not at all funded by taxpayer dollars? That last part is correct. The first part is not. There are no <laughs> okay. taxpayer dollars involved in the construction of the airport. So Full stop, huh? Some smart person out there might say, well, gee, you get grants from the FAA. And we do. Uh, it comes from a particular fund that is created by fuel federal fuel taxes. And we get back roughly about half of the fuel taxes that are contributed by the fuel bought here at SLC for airplanes. Wow. I now feel like knowing that the airport isn't funded by my tax dollars, I feel less entitled to complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> we're, we're open for feedback. You know, we aim to please. Okay. Okay. The next question I have for you is the toughest one I'm going to ask you, but I feel like you can take it in stride. You seem very, very amenable. <laughs> Something that surprised me when I was looking into these numbers is that you are the highest paid city employee. Publicly available data from 2022 shows your salary at $329,000, which is twice what Mayor Mendenhall made. Yeah. How do you justify your salary? Well, um, I've been in this position or a position like that uh, for several parts of my career. For airport directors, there are a lot of us out there. So there are lots of ways to uh, compare uh, from one airport to another. We're the 15th largest airport in the United States, or actually we were during COVID. We're back to 23 now that everybody else has recovered. But uh, mm. 
I came from Portland where I was executive director of the Port of Portland. I made more there than I make here. Uh, and mm. so it's not um, uncommonly high for airport directors. And as I said, there are 30 large hub airports in the United States. You looked around, you'd find a lot of very comparable uh, salaries. It's basically based on market. Okay, so do I want your job? Um, I Is it sought after? Uh, oh, yeah, it's a great job. <laughs> in Portland, I was in both the airport and seaport business, and I really like it a lot. Airports, this one in particular, has some really unique qualities to it. Um, we're we're going to be, over President's Day weekend, we're going to be establishing regular daily records for the number of people who show up at the airport every day. Uh, and you see and experience the comings and goings, and you get a direct connection between what we do, which may seem mundane from one day to the next, to um, what it produces, what what actually happens as a result. Families coming and going. We have, of course, returning missionaries, which is completely unique in the United States. Yeah. These families, neighborhoods, whole communities come out with the handmade signs. And, you know, it's really, it's a very special place. And um, I really appreciate that I get to do this. Uh, it's very unique. And yeah, I think uh, I'd say go for it. <laughs> okay. It's not available at the moment, but... <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> if you decide you want to run the Inland Port, let me know. I'll I'll get after your job. <laughs> what is our daily record that we're going to break? It happened during the NBA All-Star Game, and it was uh, uh, what I call 35,000 people, and it's at the front door. In other words, people who are here and who are leaving or are coming to uh, Salt Lake. And just to okay. put that in perspective, um, if there are 35,000 people at the front door, there are another probably 40,000 or so connecting. Wow. So 75,000 people every day at the airport, not including the 17,000 people who have a badge, which is really significant. So um, yeah, it's a small city here. Yeah. Well, on the note of expanding business, we are adding more and more routes, which is very exciting. How do you pick them? Well, um, first, the airlines really make a decision about where they're going to fly to. So we don't just say, you know, you're going to fly to here, you're going to fly to there. That's really, they're, they're, they're their own independent and private businesses. But what we mm -hmm. do is uh, look for places that are underserved uh, based on our population uh, and uh, the, the travel metrics uh, here in Salt Lake or places that people would like to go to that aren't currently served and for which uh, we know there is a market. And this is a very, it's a very sophisticated uh, business of determining where there are sufficient potential passenger volumes available and then bring that to the attention of an airline or several airlines. And we particularly focus on international destinations. We'd like to see more. Hmm. That's a uh, way more complicated than Delta deciding whether they're going to add, you know, a tenth new daily frequency to Atlanta, for example. They don't need our help in figuring out whether that's going to work. They know that. Yeah. But um, Hawaiian Airlines is coming to Salt Lake International. They haven't been here before. Uh, they're going to be adding daily service to Honolulu. Uh, and Delta already flies to Honolulu. And that just gives you a little sense that you know, now that there is some competition in that marketplace, uh, direct competition, maybe the fares will be more competitive. When Spirit Airlines started here, they began nonstop service from Salt Lake to Orlando, okay, home of Disney World and I think also L.A. Well, uh, that increases the level of competition. And, of course, Spirit is a, um, we would call them a low-cost, ultra-low-cost airline. Uh, yeah, so tell me about it. We try to look for things like that. And even if you don't want to fly Spirit, the airlines serving Orlando are going to have to respond to that by uh, reducing their fares to some extent. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And we're excited about the potential for expansion of international air service, in particular here in Salt Lake. Hmm. Last year, SLC signed a new lease with Delta to yeah. continue their growth. Of course, they took back Vivint Arena, which is now the Delta Center again. Can you explain the relationship with Delta a bit? Why are they our main guy? 
Well, uh, this all started back in, you know, the 80s when Western Airlines served Salt Lake. And Western was, as their name implies, a a Western-based airline. They were based here in Salt Lake. And uh, they began to struggle uh, a bit. And so um, some of the leadership here in the local community kind of arranged for a marriage between Western and Delta. And Delta at that time was primarily an Eastern airline, East Coast airline. Yeah, so they, Atlanta. Yeah, they bought uh, Western. They saw that as their way to expand into the West Coast. And they have used Salt Lake as a hub ever since. And, you know, if you think about it, Salt Lake uh, geographically is really well suited to be a hub uh, and, you know, Delta has four main hubs, Atlanta, Detroit, Minneapolis, and Salt Lake. They have many hubs in LA, in Seattle, in Miami, for example. But Salt Lake is what makes the West Coast work for Delta. Uh, And that's really the way they viewed it until somewhat recently, when they began to just appreciate the fact that Utah and Salt Lake were really growing significantly. Business has grown remarkably here. uh, And all of a sudden, it's a market to focus on all by itself. And I think that's really brought great rewards here. And so not only have they been all in on this huge project here, this is the largest public works project in the history of Utah. Uh, It's just been remarkable for Delta. They're seeing and experiencing a lot of growth here uh, and have really fallen back in love, I would say, with Salt Lake. Um, Hmm. When the Delta Center was the Delta Center before, they ended up having to give up the naming rights. And it was a bitter pill back in Atlanta at HQ. But I think Delta was really intent on regaining uh, that that brand awareness here. Uh, And, you know, let's face it, Delta Center sounds a little better than the three or four other uh, names under which that place has gone for the last few years. Salt Lake City, how's this legislative session treating you? If you're feeling misrepresented, here's what you need to know. Every single Utah representative and half of our senators are up for re-election this year. And the voters, a lot of them care most about impressing, are party delegates. Which is why Women's Work Utah, an organization that focuses on the political influence of Utah women, wants you to get involved in this delegate system. If you feel like your political voice and values are completely swept away by the time your ballot arrives, this is your chance to run it back. Pick a political party and show up on Neighborhood Caucus Night, Tuesday, March 5th. You might decide to become a party delegate or choose ones you trust from among your neighbors. Without your input at caucus, policies and candidates will be selected anyway. So weigh in now before it's too late. Get all the information you need to do this at womensworkutah.com. Hey, it's Emily Means, executive producer of CityCast Salt Lake. I love my job, but making this podcast and newsletter every day isn't always easy. Sometimes we have some, shall we say, technical difficulties. Like if a guest falls through last minute, or a construction crew is jackhammering in the background of an interview. It might seem small, but for our four-person team's daily production schedule, it can really set us back. But even on those tough days, my team and I work hard to bring you a newsletter and podcast for tomorrow. That's because we know how important it is to you to have this reliable, daily way of making sense of what's happening in our city. So we always find a way to show up for you. The CityCast Salt Lake membership program is about asking you to show up for us. Members help make sure we can keep doing this work that matters to you and your neighbors. Because we all want the best for this city we call home. Members get special perks like ad-free listening and exclusive updates. You can become a member at membership.citycast.fm. Thank you. 
I mean, when you don't fly Delta, the thing that happens is that you probably have to get to the B gate. And it's been the butt of so many jokes how long the walk is from the A gate to the B gate. I remember last April Fool's Day, someone put the walk on all trails as a hike. And I thought that was pretty. I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, you guys did it? We did it. (laughs) That's good. Absolutely. That's good. Bravo. That's good. But we're told that we're going to be getting a tunnel to make things quicker. Here's my question. Literally, how will the central tunnel work? Because isn't there already a tunnel? Like, how will it be yeah. a faster tunnel? So a little history, which I think is important, um, and that is that the airport or, or the city, I should say, completed a master plan. And so this last master plan was done in 1996 in advance of the Olympic Games. Huh. And the idea was to do this project immediately after the Games, right? And then, of course, no one could easily have anticipated uh, the events of 9-11. Airlines right. were not feeling expansive. So the airport city stepped back and said, all right, we'll 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 wait. How about 2008? Oh, no. Financial crisis comes. All the carriers go through bankruptcy. Nobody's thinking about building new airports. Mm-hmm. Then in 2010, um, the, the city got serious again and said, okay, we got to start this now. So it took that long. But then they began looking at just the logistics of what would happen to keep the old airport running while building a new one. And so where the mid-concourse tunnel is, which is the butt of so many jokes, that tunnel was actually constructed with a grant from the FAA back in 2004 in order to enable the construction of the rest of the airport because it is underneath you know, the taxiway that runs between A and B. And if you were to dig that tunnel today, you would stop all traffic, all uh, air traffic. And so the decision was made, let's build that tunnel. It's only for the interim uh, until um, we can open uh, portions of B, portions of A. And then when we open here and tear down the old airport, we'll build this new central tunnel that leaves from the center of the A concourse to the what will be the center of the B concourse. Today, if you're flying on United, you come to the airport, you go through the checkpoint, you go out of the checkpoint, you go to the central plaza. Oh, I can see the B concourse. It's right there. Then you walk mm-hmm. a quarter mile out of your way, go yeah. through the tunnel, and then you walk almost a quarter of a mile back to where United is. So in the future, that left turn will not be necessary if you're going to uh, the B concourse. You'll go straight. Now, I've also been asked many times, why is it so far away? Why is B so far away from A? (laughs) And the reason is, if you park the largest possible aircraft that we serve on the A concourse, Mm -hmm. and then you park one directly across from it on the B concourse, which is possible, And then you have these taxiways in between. The distance is the minimum distance the FAA allows uh, for that scenario. In other words, you have to have a certain separation between those planes. And the real reason why Salt Lake feels so big today, it's brand new. We built it for the aircraft that we serve. The old airport, the oldest part of the old airport, was built to serve DC-3s. Okay, that's the first plane I ever flew on. It would take off like this, incredibly loud, uh, no yeah. pressurized uh, cabin, so you couldn't fly much above 10,000 feet. You compare that aircraft to an Airbus 330 or uh, you know, a Boeing 767, and it's tiny, little tiny thing. So now we yeah. have these large planes with big wingspans. Uh, and that's why the gate hold areas are as large as they are in order to accommodate uh, those planes. So, hmm. you know, we built a 21st century um, airport uh, for 21st century air travel, including accommodation of 21st century airplanes. It's all just bigger. OK, well, so in terms of time on the clock, then right now from the central plaza, the start of kind of the A gate to the start of the B gate, how long is the walk for the average person and how long will it be yeah. with the new central tunnel? I do it because it's 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 available now. It's not open to the public, but I'm down there all the time. 
I can do it in about seven minutes. Okay, that's good. And that's without without using the moving walkways. We will also have carts down there for uh, people who are challenged and need that. So it'll be a much better experience. And what's our open date on that? Uh, it is mid-October 20 of this year. <gasps> okay. Yeah. All right. That's good. We're excited. Okay. This is great news for people like me who want to, A, book the cheapest flight, which often means ignoring my Delta credit card, and B, get to the airport 30 minutes before the plane departs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to ask, what's your dream direct flight from Salt Lake that we don't yet have? Uh, I would say the most important and the biggest dream would be Incheon, South Korea, which is the hub of Korean Airlines. Uh, and they are uh, a Delta joint venture partner. Uh, and um, there are some legal issues going on right now in Korea and with the United States about uh, just market conditions in Korea. I expect that to get resolved. And then I expect to see a nonstop flight from Salt Lake to Incheon, and that opens up all of Asia. Uh, huh. I, I can't even remember how many nonstops there are from Incheon to other places. Everywhere in China, you know, Taiwan, uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, and so forth. And something like 90% of the world's population, when this happens, will then have one stop access to Salt Lake City. In, in other words, they only have to make one other stop before they get to Salt Lake City. Yeah. Wait, I mean, is this in the cards? Yeah, oh, yeah, it definitely. Well, these legal issues have to be resolved. I would say somewhere in 25 would be reasonable, okay. you know. Okay. So long before we get the Olympics. Oh, yeah. No, it'll be fantastic. Yeah. It is interesting if you dig around... I feel like that was a tunnel pun. I didn't mean to make it. <laughs> if you dig around this city, there are so many infrastructure projects that are tied to the Olympics. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear you talk about even just the fact that the old tunnel we have, you know, has to do with yeah. our Olympic dream. Yeah. This expansion has obviously been in the works since long before we knew we were most likely getting the 2034 Olympics. But now that that is coming down the pike, I wonder if you have kind of like a quick wish list for airport upgrades we might get in tandem with the games. Well, we're actually uh, doing some things now and did some things already in advance. So if you go down into the lobby of the airport today, you're going to see ski bags, board bags. I mean, hmm. uh, and we designed the whole bag handling system around oversized bags. So if you come to the airport with your ski bag, I mean, why would you? Because you're going to be skiing here. Or you're not going to Denver. But just, <laughs> you know, imagine that for a moment. You bring your ski bag to the airport. It can be inducted into the bag system at any point where any other bag could be indu inducted. Most airports mm -hmm. and in our old airport, you had to kind of go down to the end of the uh, terminal building and give it to some guy who ran it through a machine and, you know, and so on and so yep. forth. Not anymore. But if you think about the Olympics, most of the athletes are going to be arriving probably not through the international terminal. They're going to be arriving mm -hmm. here on charter aircraft if they're part of a team and so on and so forth. So they probably uh, won't be here. The people who are going to come here are people who are, uh, you know, they may be coaches, they may be agents, they may be fans, they may be yeah. people who just want to be part of it all. And we still have people working at the airport today who are here during the 2002 Olympics. And so we have a little playbook uh, that is mainly focused <laughs> on operations. How do we just manage all of the traffic? And the thing about big events like this is it's not the stuff that happens before the event. It's the day after the event um, is done because most people, you know, people arrive over a period of time, but they all leave at the same time. So that closing yeah. day is it's going to be wild. Uh, and we are making some adjustments to the bag handling system that will give it added capacity because we're growing. Uh, and so we're doing that now. 
when the day comes that there will be a sea concourse, we know exactly where it's going to go. And there are things in its way. So we'll be undertaking enabling projects to get those things out of its way so that when the time hmm. comes, somebody will push the button and off we'll go. Hmm. Okay. We did an episode of this podcast last year where we raided the airport, executive producer Emily Means and I, and we gave it a pretty good rating. There were a couple things we pointed to. Um, I really love the scent in the bathrooms. <laughs> Do you know what it is? <laughs> uh, I don't. But my predecessor, uh, Maureen Riley, who was deeply involved in the design issues, everybody, and I know Maureen, everybody described her as the bathroom committee of one. Uh, and uh, for airports, bathrooms are, especially a hub airport, bathrooms are incredibly important. The old airport, hmm. I can remember in both the men's and the women's bathrooms, lines out the door all the time. And so yeah. uh, she made it her job to me to be sure that there were enough, number one, and that uh, for the women's bathrooms, for example, there is, we all call it potty parity. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's actually way in excess of what uh, the current building codes require. Uh, but we put just a lot of time and energy into the bathrooms. And when you hear passengers talk about Salt Lake, especially ones that aren't from here, they talk about concessions cleanliness and bathrooms and yep. you know you hate to be reduced to you know three words or whatever it is but the reality is that's what's so important to people if you're connecting here you get off a plane first thing you're going to do you know is hit the head and then get onto your gate and so being able to do that cleanly efficiently you know the stalls all have doors uh that are uh, canted in such a way so that there's no way to see through it. They're very low to the ground. They're very high up. They're extra large. You can take your bag in with you if you want to change, yes. for example. Now, mm -hmm. older airports just don't, they don't, they can't do that. It's very difficult to do. And all of that is the result of just an immense amount of time and energy that went into um, bathrooms, thinking about bathrooms. Yeah, it's amazing. I think Something I brag about about the Salt Lake Airport often is how many local vendors we have and local concessions. I thought it was really well done to incorporate local Salt Lake businesses. It's not just Starbucks and McDonald's kind yeah. of lining the walls. Yeah. But I have to tell you something that makes me kind of anxious when I think about connecting because I've had many layovers gone awry is I feel like we need more crisis seating. Like, I would love a place where you can lay down and have a nap if your connection is like eight hours. Yeah. I know they have these in, in Paris and Char de Gaulle. We do have uh, on the B concourse, I think it is, a place called Treats. Um, you can rent a bed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is something like it on the A concourse as well. And that's primarily what their business is. Most mm -hmm. big international airports have more of that available because... Uh, the connections there can be hours. If you go to Singapore, yeah. for example, you might land at 11 at night and your connecting flight is 1130 the next morning. Man, and they have a hotel connected right to the airport. We will have mm -hmm. a hotel in our future. Um, I will say that the seating in the gate areas is pretty generous. Um, and so you see people you see people crashed out all over the place at night. Uh, fortunately, we don't have too many misconnections. Salt Lake has a really mm -hmm. good reputation for, you know, weather operations. And that's because it's been worth it for us to invest in the proper equipment. If you're in Atlanta, it doesn't happen often enough to justify uh, the huge expense. But here, yeah. it's, you know, every year. Yeah. Last question before I let you go. What does our airport need to become a world-class airport? Well, I would say it is a world-class airport. Uh, we mm -hmm. have visitors here from all over the globe because it is so new. People want to see the new technology, how it works, our new bag handling system, the exit lanes that go from the terminal uh, to from the secure side to uh, the non-secure side. They're automated and, you know, this is getting into geekdom, but they're really 
great. Uh, so is that the thing you walk through yeah, and the doors? Yes, yeah, are, and you, it's like the Matrix, yeah. and you're in com- you're walking with someone, you're in conversation, and then you just briefly pause to yeah. go through the doors and yeah. then pick it up on the other side. Yeah, I love this. They're uh, they're incredibly valuable uh, because if we didn't have them, we would be required to pay for. Um, people to stand on the other side to make sure that no one reverses and goes backwards Mm. uh, through them. You can't really uh, with these. But I I think uh, the airfield is um, incredibly thoughtfully designed. All of the service uh, vehicles out here, they're all electric. Um, and we are electrifying the airport campus. So I feel like we're not the largest airport in the world, but I do feel like Salt Lake can pretty easily stake its claim to be a world-class um, airport. The old airport was wonderful. It served its purpose, um, but it had come to the end of its useful life. Uh, and this one is going to be here for generations to come. The integration of the art program here with the architecture is really fabulous. So I don't, um, I'm not going to just assume that that's not where we're at. I think that this is a world-class airport. All right. Bill Wyatt, Executive Director of Salt Lake City International Airport. Thank you so much for your time. I want your job. (laughs) Great. That's my decision. I'll let you know when I'm on, on the way out. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Just an FYI, those Hawaiian Airlines nonstop routes start May 16th. We will be back from Hawaii tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.